Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Al Avina, Executive Director of the Blinded Veterans Association, an organization of blinded veterans helping other blinded veterans. The Blinded Veterans Association was established after the Second World War and now provides service programs, resources, and legislative advocacy to improve blinded veterans' lives. Al has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Al, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So the Blinded Veterans Association has a very interesting history. It is actually a self-help group that was established by the veterans themselves. Talk about the history of the Blinded Veterans Association. Well, basically it was established in 1945 during the World War. Most of the blind veterans at that time were being housed in Avon, uh, just north of here. And uh, through some great help through Father Carroll, who did a lot of great work in the Boston, Massachusetts area, who was already working very significantly in the blind community, decided to provide some additional training to the blind veterans. And because of their leadership and what they've already been doing and their ability to adapt to different situations, he really encouraged them to develop an association or an organization to help themselves. So. As a result, in 1945, many of these individuals, both officers and enlisted, got together and decided to create this association. They were very nervous folks at that time because they were afraid at that time. Uh, the Veterans Administration was under the Department of Defense. It was kind of like a sub-agency within Department of Defense. And they were afraid there was going to be a little bit of retaliation of sorts uh, from them trying to create this uh, self-organization to help other blind veterans. The officers backed away. The enlisted decided to go, go on and, and have their meeting to go forward and go ahead and organize. And as a result, uh, everything went off without any kind of hitch. The officers <laughs> came in the very next day and uh, put some more order to the organization and started establishing and creating officers and positions and then eventually led to the incorporation and the expansion to what it is today. If you will, talk about the programs that you have today and, and their evolution. Initially, the first program was primarily all advocacy. The blind veterans that were at that time being housed at Avon realized that they were capable of a lot more. They were learning how to get around on their own and through Father Carroll's encouragement and getting long cane training at that time, uh, they were able to do a lot more. So what they decided to do was really push and advocate for the Veterans Administration at that time to create and establish a blind rehabilitation center. Uh, the first was eventually, in fact, established in 1946 in Hines, Chicago, which is still the first one and still operates today. Uh, what they were able to do there was provide a lot of the orientation and mobility, manual skills, living skills, just specialized training and learning how to do things a little bit differently on their own so that they have that independence and that they can go out and uh, do what they want. In other words, they're just going to empower them to do whatever it is they want to do. They're not going to really uh, keep them housed like they were being kept before in Avon. A lot of them went on uh, not only volunteering within the organization uh, to continue to promote other advocacy and, and expand the program of blind rehab, which there's 13 now, uh, inpatient blind rehab and 16 outpatient rehabilitation centers across the country and Puerto Rico. Um, so we've been very busy in, in making sure that the VA continued to provide those, th those services so that the blind veterans can in fact continue to get the training that they would need, empower them to live independent lives. So you have an advocacy piece but you also have a training piece in terms of, of, uh, of uh, maneuvering with the long cane skills? And that's actually done at the blind rehab centers. The they conduct rehab. all the training. The, the important part at the blind rehab centers, which is a little different from what you find in the community-based rehabilitation centers mm -hmm. to do provide similar services, is that a blind veteran was at one time uh, able to see fine uh, for one reason or the other, whether they were injured or whether they had an accident or whether uh, they were wounded or they suffer from some age-related vision loss, they were all able to see and understand. So when you lose your vision, there's, there's 
a little bit of an adjustment period. Some people take a lot longer to adjust. So when you put all these blind veterans together through these programs, the most important piece that we feel is the camaraderie and the peer mentoring that one another go through as they kind of did in the military where you suffer together and you move forward and you be, create these wonderful bonds. And it's not only about understanding one another in the rehabilitation process to do the best thing for yourself there, but also just in general purposes. I mean, out in the world, you, they share those experiences, and whether they have difficulty doing something on a computer or understanding something at a grocery store. They, sharing those experiences is, is a huge, huge step in overcoming uh, the challenges that one faces and, and adapting to whatever their difficulties are. Uh, in many cases now, especially because of the most current wars, you have individuals now that have uh, polytrauma where they have more than one disability in some cases. Uh, the vision loss isn't even the most uh, significant challenge they have. So if you can imagine these individuals now have an opportunity to share those experiences with other individuals that are of a like mind and, and kind of realize where they're coming from, you don't find that in the community-based community programs. There's no knock against that. It's just a different mentality and because of their experiences in the military, uh, that shared experience really gets them to uh, overcome those uh, times where individuals feel depressed. And treatment needs to align to how the condition uh, evolved and the attributes of the, of the condition itself. As you say, most people who have been veterans um, have uh, suffered a different uh, vector of development uh, than people who are sightless in the general populace. Mm -hmm. um, they generally um, experience sightlessness at an older age um, and, and for various uh, reasons. You, for example, uh, uh, did not lose your sight because of some dramatic event. You contracted a, a condition. Talk about your own journey. Well, my own journey is very different. Uh, individuals that end up having diseases like myself usually uh, start suffering from this much older in life. Uh, when I was in the military and, and, and uh, working my way through the ranks, so to speak, uh, I was functioning just fine at a high level, doing my job on a regular basis, and uh, went in for a routine eye exam, and uh, they found something odd. So I, after being sent from one specialist to another, they eventually diagnosed me with a, a disease of retinitis pigmentosa and told me that I was going to go blind. I didn't know what to think at the moment other than I still completely able to do my job. So I fought it and uh, what's called the medical evaluation board and right. a physical evaluation board. When I fought that, I got my commanders to stand up for me and basically say the same thing, that I was not impacted by my job at that time. The disability or the, the disease I had at that point uh, hadn't really started affecting the quality of my work. Uh, up to that point, I was still firing an expert. Uh, a couple years later, in 1996, I was working on, on the computer on some evaluation reports, uh, looking at the screen one second, the next, everything went blurry. Uh, after regaining my composure after a few minutes, I eventually stood up and told my commanders what was going on. Started the evaluation, medical and physical evaluation board all over again and, and was event eventually chaptered out. Uh, knowing that eventually this was going to happen to me at some point in time, I prepared a lot of things so that when I got out, I was able to align and ensure that all the services through the Veterans Affairs were going to come to me almost immediately on, upon my exit. That's not the case today, and that's not wasn't even the normal case then. I just was very prepared at that point because I knew what was eventually going to happen to me. In terms of the work of the Blinded Veterans Association, how does the community itself, as a self-help community, deal with helping individuals along these different disparate um, uh, areas. We do provide a lot of advocacy. We do become a resource and in some cases one of the services we provide is, is where we have the veterans sign a power of attorney where we strictly handle their claims and benefits. 
we act on their behalf to ensure that uh, the veteran uh, claims and benefits that are filed, uh, that they end up receiving exactly what they're entitled to. Uh, all of our field service officers and staff across the country are all blind veterans themselves. So not only are they familiar with working and navigating the VA system and the layers of bureaucracy that, that come with it, but as blind veterans themselves, they end up becoming role models, role models and peers for those individuals as well, showing them uh, in many cases when they meet a new blind veteran, that's the first blind veteran that they've ever met. And when they see them come off a plane or riding a bus or getting on a metro somewhere and letting them know, that newly blind veteran, that I'm going to handle your case and this is how I'm going to do it and this is what we're going to do they become a little bit more relaxed and they open up and it's more of just a claims management process. Uh, we, we really create and establish a very good rapport with the blind veterans. I mean, we're part of the same community. So because of that, it, it's not just uh, a claim manager that um, you would typically see within the VA system and then you just kind of get put on, a, on someone's desk somewhere. We have heard uh, recently about some of the uh, terrible waiting lines mm -hmm. and some of the very poor treatment that has been afforded to our veterans at some of the VA facilities. Mm -hmm. other, other VA facilities, of course, provide excellent care. Yes. Um, what is your relationship with the, uh, with, uh, the VA? And, and how <clears throat> do you see them adjusting to the uh, information that has come out about their deficiencies? Well, our relationship is as a chartered veteran service organization, once a year we have to testify to Congress and, and kind of give them updates as to what's going on within the BVA and the blind community and the service that's being provided at the Veterans Affairs. Uh, as a result, uh, since I've been on board in the last couple of years, we've kind of expanded what we've done and started to um, something that the VA might have probably been doing on their own, which is a little bit more oversight and investigation of the blind rehab centers that provide the rehabilitative care for our blind veterans. So we go in there and we talk to the staff. We let them know that we're not there uh, to take their jobs. We're not there to nitpick every little thing that they do. Uh, we're not only there advocating for the blind veterans themselves to make sure that they get the proper care that they deserve, but also that we want to address the clinicians, the doctors, the rehabilitative instructors to ensure that they have exactly what they need to provide that best care for our blind veterans. So much of this comes down to resource and, and taking scarce resource and mm -hmm. investing it wisely. Do you feel that there is sufficient resource that uh, the United States of America is investing in care of our veterans uh, coming back, uh, particularly from combat, but also veterans who have been within the system for a long time and still require uh, uh, care? No, there's not enough resources. There's just not enough manpower with the huge influx of newly wounded veterans uh, that are overwhelming the VA system. Uh, granted, this has been a problem since I went into the system almost 18 years ago myself. So this, this isn't something new. Uh, the veteran community continues to grow as a result of uh, medicine. People are living longer. Uh, more people come into the system faster than they're leaving the system. Uh, I, I think there wasn't sufficient planning to be able to meet the needs of the number of veterans that were flooding into the system, especially most recently uh, with almost two million in the last uh, dozen years. Well, it's more than that, but it, it almost two million in the last dozen years, just flooding into the system, not having enough surgeons, not having enough uh, general practitioners, not having enough uh, specialized uh, doctors. Uh, then you have all the other uh, services and social work services that they provide as well. As the VA continued to expand the social work services that they provide and you expand it to all the VA hospitals, uh, I, I don't think there was sufficient planning to meet that need, not only to provide that throughout the VA system, but also with the huge influx of the veterans flooding into the system as well. On the positive side, are there, are there also uh, innovative practices that have helped 
uh, of veterans and can help uh, blinded veterans even more. I'm thinking, for example, of the fact that today, through interactive technology, you have the ability to read books aloud mm -hmm. um, without necessarily hiring a reader for you. You can listen to audio books through, through computers, through tablets, and so on. Sure. Uh, you can take the daily uh, newspaper and uh, Apple and Google and so on have these uh, th these voice uh, systems uh, naturally mm -hmm. speaking and so on um, that can uh, give um, blinded individuals, including veterans, uh, some some pretty interesting options that they can take. Are there uh, other uh, investments that could be made? Um, to apply the technology resource of this country to mm -hmm. solving some of the problems that veterans face? I don't think it's resources. I think it's more about education. The technology is out there. The know-how is out there. It's just a lot of people are not aware that maybe adding a little extra code on, a, on an app or doing things just slightly different on an ATM machine uh, any individual, including blind veterans, in some cases uh, paralyzed veterans who don't have use of their upper extremities, use software similar that's all voice activated, but rely on the same type of coding that we do. If, if there's more universal design built into the apps and the technology that's grown at a rapid pace, uh, then there's really no limitations to any individual who's blind, whether they're a veteran or not. So when you're talking about education, it's not just education of the blinded veterans. It's, it's the blinded veterans acting as educators for product development and these product develop, developers being educated Correct. in the needs of people who are sightless or people who, are, um, who, who, have, uh, who have suffered restricted mobility so mm -hmm. that they can start designing products and increasingly incorporate um, certain features and functions into products so that those blinded veterans can become consumers of those products and benefit from them. A absolutely. Uh, there's not too many blinded veterans I don't know that don't own some sort of a smartphone that has uh, built-in technology to allow them to use the phone just like any other person would. Uh, it's a little different, uh, but they're able to use all the features that are there. Are there any other um, aspects that you'd like to cover? Well, our, our biggest initiative, I, I would say, is, is empowerment through access. So talk uh, about empowerment through access. Well, whether it's accessing um, the VA medical system, uh, as everyone knows right now in the news, it's very difficult to access that. We, we help there in, in accessing and uh, making sure that there are, f there are problems somewhere that we try to address that and, and, and act on the veterans' behalf. Uh, we're uh, empowering them through access to uh, connect them with other resources, whether it's transportation access, whether it's accessing information on the internet that uh, maybe with a standardized screen reader that uh, a blind individual would use to have the text on that screen read to them. Uh, many of the VA systems are not what's called accessible, so the screen readers don't recognize what's on there, so we really push on making sure that the VA uh, makes the coding accessible and builds in that universal design so that those veterans can then access the information on their own. It, it's all about empowering them to do what it is they want to do through access. So it's, it's a, a matter, again, of educating mm -hmm. and then advocating for the, t the appropriate investments, the appropriate designs that allow veterans uh, to navigate to themselves uh, assure the, their own treatment, uh, with the first step being that uh, the, the people who are charged mm -hmm. need to understand the needs of their consumers and need to address those needs in, in a way that, that makes it easier for them to have their services consumed. To have their services consumed if the veteran chooses to or to do whatever it is they want to do. I mean, we, we don't want and we're not here for a handout to those veterans. We're there to provide them a hand up so that they can do what it is they want to do. Alavina, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Blinded Veterans Association with us and thank you for your insights. Thank you.